And Ms. Kasha Jacqueline Navagesera, who you will hear from today, received the Right Livelihood Award in 2015 for her courage and persistence despite violence and intimidation in working for the rights of LGBTIQ plus people to a life free from prejudice and persecution. We are proud to continue to support her and her work, which is now more important than ever, because it is heart-wrenching to observe that throughout the years, the situation of LGBTIQ plus people in Uganda has only become more dangerous. In February this year, the parliament began reconsidering and eventually adopted the Anti-Homosexuality Act, one of the world's harshest legislations of its kind. Under this law, sexually and gender diverse persons can not only be sentenced to life imprisonment, but could face the death penalty for acts of, quote, aggravated homosexuality, or 20 years in prison for, quote, promoting homosexuality. While this is far from being the only legal tool to the Ugandan that the Ugandan government has at its disposal to criminalize and discriminate against the LGBTIQ plus community, it is unprecedented in its scope and application as a similar version of the law had been scrapped by the Supreme Court in 2014. At our event today, our distinguished panelists will shed light on the drivers and the implications of this egregious piece of legislation. This event will also be an opportunity to reflect on the role that states and the United Nations can play in holding the Ugandan authorities to account for their blatant disregard towards their international obligations. This event is even more relevant given the upcoming yearly interactive dialogue which the Council will hold in just a couple of days with the UN Independent Expert on SOPI, who I have the pleasure to introduce as our first panelist today. In his capacity, Mr. Victor Madrigal Borlos assesses the implementation of international human rights law, engages in dialogues with all relevant stakeholders, and provides advisory services, technical assistance and capacity building to help address violence and discrimination against persons based on their sexual orientation, and gender identity. The report, which is to be presented on Wednesday, will focus on the spaces where freedom of religion and belief intersect with protection from violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. In Uganda, homophobia is a societal fact and, deny and the denial of rights is indeed often justified with religious arguments. So turning to you, Victor, can you shed light on how we can explain the periodical adoption of homophobic laws in Uganda and the reproposal of this anti-homosexuality act? And in light of your recent report, how is religion used to strengthen societal homophobia? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ole, and uh, good evening to everyone. It's good to see some friends in the audience and also some uh, uh, no faces, so wonderful to, to be with you all. Um, I think that this invites, this particular topic invites a reflection that could be placed in two different contexts. There is a specific one, which is our reaction to what is indeed the entrenchment of state-sponsored uh, persecution. And in very many cases, the certainty that some of the tools that are available to the state for implementation in Uganda are being utilized to the purpose of entrenching violence and discrimination. The specific case of Uganda is something in which I am on record along with uh, several of my colleagues in expressing dismay at how this legislation found its way not only in the recent times, but beginning in 2014 and following uh, political conversation as early, conversations as early as 2008. The High Commissioner is on record as having expressed dismay and profound worry in a very detailed way making reference to this legislation. So how is this to happen? And I guess that invites a different level of observation and reflection, which is what is law to be used? Or what is the nature of law 
And what is the extent in which legislation that is contrary to human rights standards, a violation of international human rights law as such? When trying to explain how it is that legislation such as this comes to the fore, I think one should begin to understand how it connects to the understanding of law as a fundamental democratic tool. And as a fundamental democratic tool, law is not only supposed to be reflecting the will of the majority, but it's also supposed to reflect the protection of the rights of minorities. In situations where, because of many reasons, there may be stigma and profound ignorance as to the lived realities of persons who, because of many reasons, usually detailed in the Universal Declarations of Human Rights, are subject to violence and discrimination. So I think one of the elements in which I would place the considerations as to how this comes to be is a dissonance between the way in which one understands law as a tool of democracy and how one understands law as a tool of political conduct. And because law can be conceived, democratic processes can be conceived also as tools for political profit, the othering and the instrumentalization of the realities of certain communities and peoples and populations can also be weaponized in the context of lawmaking and political discourse. And of course, this is not exclusive to LGBT persons, but it is very much the case of LGBT persons where all over the world, we see how narratives concerning their lives are actually utilized to galvanize political bases. When the system is not strong enough to provide tools and checks and balances, legislation that is profoundly by a, a profound violation of international human rights standards can come to it. And uh, to make reference to the second question that you were mentioning, uh, Ole, in particular, that is the case when not only societal stigma comes to play, but also the voices of those that are meant to exercise moral authority within the community namely religious leaders. I was horrified when I heard the Speaker of Parliament, of course she's not a religious leader, but fundamenting the idea that this legislation passed as a way of defending what are called Christian rights. The idea that religious narratives are utilized to actually ensure the perpetuation of violence and discrimination is something that concerns me deeply because we know that it actually leads to further violence and further discrimination. And so I think that that particular field in which the use of these narratives is actually put at the service of ideals other than that of democracy, ideals other than the prevalence of human rights, ideals other than equality before the law, is the moment in which we actually see situations that are falling on to the extreme, which I think is very much the case of what we see in the legislation with that. Now, the other point in relation to this is that this has been part of a concerted and sustained campaign. I mentioned 2014, I mentioned the political debates that I have been following since 2008. There has been a concerted campaign in which at some point, these opportunities were being saw as having just the right configuration in the political scenario. And one of the issues where I think we need to be particularly cautious and particularly careful is because these issues are instrumentalized, they're not, they're not a conquest that is immune from regression in any context. Again, I place the case of Uganda, both in the importance of the Ugandan LGBT community, but also as an exemplary issue that reminds us that because these issues are heavily used in the political discourse, one campaign, the outcome of one election, 
in pretty much any context around the world can actually determine 180 degrees turn of events. And I think we have enough examples where we've seen that happen. So for me, this is a typical case where you can begin to focus your concern, one's concern, our concern in the lived realities of our siblings in Uganda, where we must focus on this issue, but also understanding that this is at the center of concentric worries that extend all throughout the globe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. I think concentric worries is a concept that we take with us. Thank you for the distinction between law as a tool for democracy and law as a tool for political profit, which is very helpful. And you informed us earlier that I think you'll have to leave at some point during the event, which uh, makes me want even more to thank you on behalf of everyone uh, also in the movement and everyone who sympathizes um, with the issues we're talking about here, for the way in which you've been building this mandate and for the way in which you have been really giving shape to the debate over these last years. And during this year, the mandate is going to be coming to an end. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to turn online to Ms. Kasha Dantin Nabahe Sera. Kasha can be considered the mother of the LGBTIQ plus movement in Uganda. She's been instrumental in shedding light on human rights violations in the country, and she has successfully used the judicial system to advance LGBTIQ plus rights despite threats and attacks. For her tremendous courage, she received both the Right Livelihood and Martin Ennels Awards. In 2011, she was also listed among the 50 most inspiring feminist women in Africa. And she's a recipient of the Rafto Prize, the Sean McBride Award from Amnesty International, and the Civil Courage Prize, among others. Kasha is now the executive director of Kuchu Times Media Group, which was formed to provide a voice for Africa's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex community. And we very much look forward to your presentation, Kasha, to also help share light on the direct consequences of the adoption of the law and what's next for Uganda's LGBTIQ plus community and defenders. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Ole, for a very kind introduction. And also, Victor, it's always uh, good to listen to you and always important um and thank you actually for for talking about law being used as a tool for democracy because we've seen this play uh play a big role especially uh, on our continent and so i will not go in too much details without it i really want our audience to really know the impact um of, of this law and also to to discuss what is next what can we do because we do not want to find ourselves back in the same position because we've been here before. We've been here uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and on the 30th, as soon as um, the president signed the bill, we immediately petitioned um, in, in the Supreme Court because we knew we knew he was going to sign and we'd been ready. But we'd, we've done this before. We've petitioned before and um, we, we won the case, even if it was on a technical technicality. So the issue is, how do we prevent ourselves from being in the same situation 10 years from now? Because this is becoming um, a cycle. And it's not only just happening in Uganda, I'm afraid. Uh, we've seen that um, many other lawmakers in different parts of Africa are actually taking, taking um, examples and steps from Uganda. Why are they doing this? I think it's because Uganda's case has not really been taken seriously. If um, if the sanctions that we've called for in the past had really worked on Uganda, especially the people who are directly involved in passing these laws, I think other lawmakers from other countries wouldn't be following suit. Um, we've seen uh, lawmakers in Ghana, in Kenya, coming up with similar laws. I think this is the time where we say that Uganda has decided to be an example um, in Uganda as um, a leader on traditional values in Africa. 
So if Uganda is not dealt seriously with or severely with, other countries are going to follow suit. And we're going to see a genocide uh, in Africa if we are not careful, because just uh, since February, we've recorded over 200 cases. 200 cases, we've seen an increase in violence because now people are doing these things with impunity. The violence from state actors and non-state actors has increased. Seven days ago, we got, uh, we got seven arrests, two abductions, four evictions in just one week. Um, currently, my house has become a shelter just from the blue because people are getting evicted um, without any reason, but because people are afraid, landlords are afraid because the law will, will also, you know, work on them. And this issue, uh, people are forgetting that this law is not only affecting LGBT people. This law is also affecting our families, our employees. This law is affecting our doctors, uh, our children. So the issue is what is the international community doing to hold Uganda accountable? Because Uganda has obligations and uh, under in international human rights law. We've seen um, last year uh, during the UPR review, Uganda addressed this same uh, building uh, and said that uh, they do not discriminate against LGBT people. They protect LGBT people from violence. But within just one year, we've seen a very, um, a very, you know, big campaign against the LGBT community, it's all the way from the president to the speakers. And these are the people supposed to be protecting. These are the duty bearers supposed to be actually protecting us. And we see that no one is really holding them to account. And if this does not stop, it's going to spread. We've, we've registered already two deaths since this whole uh, uh, unfortunate saga started. So my issue is, how are we going to prevent this from spreading across the continent? A lot of evictions are happening. We are seeing conversion therapies, and this is also part, part of, uh, of the bill and uh, the law that was passed, where even the president himself, when he sent it back to the parliament, um, he recommended parliament to, to include conversion therapies. And we all know uh, and from experience what, has this, uh, what this has done uh, from other parts of the world. And examinations are continuing. We are seeing last, uh, just last seven, um, in the last seven days, we've seen uh, a transgender woman being um, mutilated and she's fighting for her life um, in, in hospital right now. We've seen the media exposing people and this is actually going um, spreading around, you know, the whole media fraternity and no one is doing anything. Um, there's impunity because people believe the state is pro protecting them. So for me, my main issue to actually sit here today is to request um, the member countries and even the friends of Sogi. When um, Victor is addressing uh, this house um, on, on Wednesday, please take the floor and call upon uh, Uganda and the government of Uganda, hold them to account, uh, consider sanctions, consider holding sanctions in your own uh, capitals, in your own countries directly, actually, for people who really um, are directly responsible for passing these laws, because this will show, uh, will send a very strong message to other parts of the continent. And also, finally, we, we would want you to support us, because now we have to to turn to remote to remote work since promotion of homosexuality is leading to, to closure of our organizations. And we've also seen our partner organizations already, already are putting hold on, on their work because this law is also affecting them. We need direct support, not only just verbally, but we also need financial support. We need material support because we are going to really change our methods of work to be able to serve our communities, to be able to take services to uh, deep to the community since now we cannot really have um, we cannot really have physical addresses as we also continue to fight the law in the Supreme Court. But for now, we really, really need a lot of support from um, friends like you. So I really thank you for making the time to be here with us and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very, very much, Kasha, for talking about the dire situation in the country.
and also for your important warning that this legislation could spread to other countries and Uganda could in a very bad way serve as a role model. But you also told us that accountability is needed and that it's the lack of impunity that only makes this possible. So that's a clear call upon member states and specifically friends of Sogi to also make your voices heard. But you also started with the remark that we've been there before. So um, this is not a hopeless situation. And we know that um, every action counts and is important in this regard. We look forward to still having you with us in the Q&A later. And in order for us to still have enough time for that, we get on and uh, I'm very happy to talk to our next speaker. Cameron Kakande, who is an activist, co-founder, and executive director of People Like Us, which works on supporting LGBTIQ plus refugees and migrants based in Munich, Germany. Cameron, what are the consequences of the anti-homosexuality law related to the right to health? And turning specifically to Ugandans living with HIV, could you tell us more about the intersecting discriminations that they face today? The floor is yours. I will thank you. Uh, before that bill was even passed, uh, there was uh, an army general in Barrera who called on the social, who called on the medical service providers to deny LGBTQ uh, people uh, health services. And there was also a list of um, organizations working with LGBT and sex, work, um, sex, work, sex workers uh, that was put out and government wanted to uh, re reinvest, sorry, to investigate about these organizations and what they do. So that puts us as the community in uh, great danger because uh, all the work we've done all the work of like having tailor-made services for LGBT people has been put into trash. Uh, before the support from our development partners like uh, PIPFA, CDC, uh, we had structures uh, to ensure access of uh, health services for LGBT persons. Uh, we had European centers. But at this, at the moment, everyone is in panic. All the peer educators can't really go to these grouping centers and access the health services. Um, as a peer educator, I can't uh, hold any training on HIV, uh, and I can't also produce materials because uh, producing uh, literature for training purposes is regarded, is regarded as promotion. And when it comes to uh, HIV prevention uh, trainings, you can't train without having uh, literature or booklets because some of uh, the information has to be in pictures. Some of the information like uh, regarding um, regarding uh, the, the sexual practices has to be like, you know, in writing. So this really puts us into danger. Uh, Medisa Navas, uh, from the time when the LDB, so when the administrative bill was passed, Medisa, uh, for, for example, in Gulu, some of the health workers uh, who had gone for an outreach program uh, were attacked by the community. And the community was saying that uh, these health service providers are enablers of homosexuality. So this puts the health service providers like whom we trained, because it took us a lot of time to train these health service providers and change their mindsets. But it puts them now in fear of carrying out the services to the LGBT people. Uh, in regards to your question, too, 
Our commentary is already registering the number of service users who are dropping off care because of fear, meaning those who have been undetectable uh, are going to default from their medication. And where does this leave us? We are going to have uh, treatment failures. We are going to have people uh, develop um, advanced HIV disease. We are going to have uh, new infections. So it's really a big dismay to the community. So with some of the examples I've given, it's very clear that uh, this law doesn't violate, doesn't, this law doesn't support the rights of queer people. Well, but it does what? It uh, stops queer people from accessing health services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cameron, for sharing these very important first-hand insights of the impact that the law has on the health sector, how it becomes impossible for you to do trainings, how in that way it really violates the rights of people in the community, and yet another way, which is by putting their health and their lives on the line. And also, you're here with us for questions later. There is no doubt that the legislation is a gross violation of Uganda's obligations under international law. Yet while Uganda's main donor countries promptly condemned the act, Kampala hosted the first, quote, Africa Interparliamentary Conference on Family Values and is now striving to inspire lawmakers from other countries in the region to put forward similar legislations, as also Kasha warned us earlier. To look at the international perspective and response, we are very happy to have yet another fantastic panelist with us online. Gurchaten Sandhu is the director of programs at ILGA World. Gurchaten is a widely respected LGBTIQ plus chain maker and community leader. Before that time at ILGA World, Gurchaten was the non-discrimination program officer at the International Labor Organization. They were also the president for UN GLOW, the group representing LGBTIQ plus personnel in the United Nations system. And they are an honoree of the OUT and Equals 2021 Global LGBTQ Corporate Advocate OUTI Award and the winner of the British LGBT Award for Exceptional Inclusion 2021. So as we're turning to you, Gurchatan, can you help us understand the regional implications of the Ugandan law and what role the international community and international organizations such as ILIA play in counterbalancing the spread of homophobic legislation? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. And it's great to be on a distinguished uh, on this panel with such distinguished guests and panelists. My apologies for not being with you in the room. I do have family, I have family commitments, which allowed me not to attend to be in person today. Um, <clears throat> so indeed, I want to, you know, so building on a lot of what has already been said, there are um, regional implications, if not global implications of this um, of this bill. Um, so we're just going to touch on a few points, and this is thanks to the work that um, our team has been do doing in the ground um, within um, been following the impact or the potential impact of these laws, as well as working closely with PI as and uh, with Pan Africa ILGA and a number of other partners. So in terms of regional influence, the, the passage of, of anti-homosexuality bills in one African country can influence neighboring nations. Countries often look to each other for inspiration, validation or justification when adopting certain uh, policies. If one country passes such a bill, it may embolden or provide a precedent for other countries to follow suit, leading to a regional trend of legislation that targets LGBTIQ plus individuals. We've already seen this in Kenya, 
Tanzania. We are hearing rumors, and we've seen this in, in Ghana, rumors in Nigeria, Niger, um, and other parts of Africa. And consequently, not just in that region, but not in the African region, but across other, um, and other regions in Asia too. We also see the implications with regards to international relations. Uh, the enactment of anti-homosexuality bills can strain relationships between African countries, also with one another as well, as well as the international community. Many uh, nations and international organizations that promote human rights collectively, including LGBTI rights, as part of their foreign policy agendas and human rights commitments. So we see that consequently the passage of discriminatory legislation can result in diplomatic tensions, aid cuts, or other forms of international pressure. For example, we've already seen statements made by the US President, Joe Biden, and European Union, and by the European Union. We've also seen several calls, in fact, very strong calls, um, which is different to what happened previously, strong calls um, from within civil society on Uganda, from Uganda, calling on um, the World Bank to suspend funding, calling on um, governments to um, suspend the visas of uh, parliamentarians who have been supporting this bill. This also has an impact for uh, the regional LGBTI community. So the passage of anti-homosexuality bills have been a chilling effect on, on uh, LGBTI persons in the region. It can contribute to a fear of discrimination, uh, fear, discrimination, stigmatization, and then making it difficult for LGBTI individuals to live their lives openly and authentically. We've seen that in some cases it's led to persecution, harassment, violence, and, so, and in worst cases, death. And not just our individuals, but we've seen the impact on organizations, organizations having to close down their activities, suspend activities to serve the communities as well. Then we can see how that those who are um, fleeing um, um, the anti-homosexuality bills in one country can create increase cross-border migration, if not uh, forced displacement of LGBTI persons. They fear, um, people are fee fleeing persecution. They may seek refuge in neighboring countries where they perceive better acceptance or legal pr uh, protection. This can potentially create a refugee, a regional refugee crisis and put further strains on neighboring countries' resources, including their asylum systems and infrastructures. We also see social and cultural tensions. Um, such bills can exacerbate existing um, social and cultural tensions within the region. It can deepen divide, like I was just mentioned earlier, between conservative and progressive segments of society, leading to increased polarization. We've also seen this in terms of an age dynamic within the countries where, you know, Ugandan youth or youth within particular countries sort of pulling away from the this narrative of hate or fear. Um, these tensions can be manifested in societal attitudes, public discourse, and even incidents of discrimination or violence that has targeted LGBTI persons. On the flip side, what we do see in terms of impact is the existence of these bills can foster better regional collaboration and solidarity among activists, which we've now actually seen, civil society organizations. Over 150 organizations have come together to sign and adopt the letter and statement urging the World Bank to suspend uh, funding. Human rights defenders across board and supporting human rights uh, defenders across the borders. They've come together to challenge these discriminatory laws. They're advocating for LGBTI rights to support each other and promote equality. There's also an economic impact. Going back to the reference on, on the World Bank lending, um, the passage of anti-homosexuality bills can have economic implications for the region. It can deter foreign investment, tourism and international partnerships. We've already seen businesses, um, open for business, for example, a... Um, a member of of ILGA, of ILGA has actually in, uh, gathered um, and mobilized businesses in the countries and in, within the region to encourage um, to start negotiations with governments on uh, prioritizing diversity and inclusion. And it makes it harder for such businesses to operate within these regions, um, leading to uh, it, which leads to um, negative in, uh, economic growth or uh, slows economic growth down and development. So what can the international community do? Uh, well, uh, we've seen already diplomatic 
pressure and advocacy can work. Governments, international organizations, human rights groups can exert diplomatic pressure on countries and advocate that they have passed or um, that they take these laws back or um, consider not passing these homosexuality bills. They can involve themselves in public statements, condemnations, and raising the issue in bilateral and multilateral forums, including trade agreements. That can be a form of pressure too. Advocacy efforts can be also involve engaging with governments lobbying for policy change and highlighting the human rights implications of such legislation. Um, for example, you know, the forums, the, the interactive dialogues that will take place this week will, could be a, a forum for that. We also see human rights monitoring and reporting. International organizations and human rights bodies can closely monitor the human rights situation, document cases of discrimination and violence against LGBTI individuals. We can see that you know, um, UNHCR can actually document, is there an increase or rise of Ugandan LGBTI individuals claiming um, refugees or, or being forcibly displaced as a consequence of this? So this then helps us to build, a, uh, build up evidence-based documentation of the human rights abuses within those countries and then serve as an advocacy tool to raise awareness. We see issues of um, better support can be provided with regards to legal support and capacity building. So legal organizations, uh, sorry, international organizations can provide legal support to LGBTI organizations, um, human rights defenders and activists uh, who are working to challenge homophobic legislation. However, that is also in itself an issue because some of these by Ad, by providing these spaces, in some cases, human rights defenders who come and challenge, uh, who present their cases, can automatically face um, being imprisoned upon return of going home. So this can be also further hindrance to this. So who can do it in their place? Um, for example, these forums can be very, very important. Economic incentives and conditionality, the international community can leverage economic incentives and conditionality to encourage countries to repeal or amend homosexuality laws. And this can involve linking financial assistance, trade agreements or development cooperation. Um, and also, as well as providing safe havens as asylum, international organizations and governments in co coordination with host countries can support the establishment of safe havens and provide asylum to LGBTIQ plus individuals. And then last, then we have also um, international organizations can facilitate dialogues among governments, civil society, religious leaders and other stakeholders to promote respect and tolerance and equality for LGBTI individuals like we're doing now. And then lastly, um, supporting local LGBTIQ plus organizations. International organizations can provide financial and technical support to LGBTIQ plus organizations and human rights defenders, such as the one that Casio belongs to and others in the country. That, include, can, that can include funding for community initiatives, capacity building programs, networking opportunities by providing them support, for example, to travel to Geneva, to New York, to other parts of the world, to, to the EU, to Brussels, to put forward their cases. And by strengthening local organizations the international community can also help empower lgbti individuals to advocate for their rights and challenge discriminatory legislation it is important for the international community and international organizations to work in collaboration with local stakeholders and respect the agency and autonomy of local lgbti communities at the ethos of this it must be a principle of do no harm do no harm do no harm and by combining efforts, they can effectively counterbalance the spread of homophobic legislation and promote human rights equality and inclusion for all LGBTI individuals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt Chatten, from us here in the room in Geneva for highlighting some of the international ramifications when it comes to uh, the spread to potential spread to other countries, as has been mentioned, uh, the diplomatic consequences, uh, consequences on people and that potential displacement, economic consequences, but then also you spoke about the, the positive flip side of opportunities for international cooperation. And I think that is a good theme, maybe and a good segue into our questions and answers, which 
will be opened with a intervention from the floor from one of our co-sponsors, the Global Interfaith Network for People of All Sexes, Sexual Orientations, Gender Identities, and Expressions. Do we have the um, intervention from the floor? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. And, uh, the... Should I or? Okay, so thank, thank you. Uh, on behalf of Jin Suji, I would like to extend our gratitude to co-organizers of this important event. We also would like to express our sincere thanks to the esteemed panelists for their insightful intervention. We are especially grateful for the, for our Ugandan colleagues, for their ongoing courage in the face of adversity. Your resilience is an inspiration for all of us. Um, Jinsu Ji stand in solidarity with the LGBTIQ community in Uganda and unequivocally condemns the Ugandan Anti-Homosexuality Act. This regressive reg legislation not only violates the fundamental rights of LGBTIQ Ugandans, but also fuel discrimination, prejudice, and violence against the LGBTIQ community and those who support them. The Ugandan government claims to protect traditional African values while simultaneously enforcing the Anti-Homosexuality Act is hard to swallow since the new act is in fact strengthening existing colonial legislations. And it is the idea of the natural nuclear family which is the Western import. Traditional African families um, comes in many configurations, are often extended and organized around seniority and lineage, not around gender. We have also heard the impact of this devastating uh, act uh, that led to uh, the increase in violence and discrimination against the LGBTIQ community and seems likely to force critical health services service providers to suspend their work, further endangering the lives of LGBT individuals. Addressing this, this issues demands international accountability and unified stance um, against such oppression, uh, oppressive legislation. Unfortunately, as has recent, uh, recently been re reported, some Western actors, including states, have financially supported politicians, organizations, and religious groups behind this act, including the US evangelicals. The funding and support from these Western entities has contributed to the dis discrimination and violence against the LGBT community in Africa, beyond uh, Uganda only. So it is urgent that the US and the European states hold those within their borders accountable for funding and supporting such harmful actions. We call on these Western states to take responsibility and play their part in rectifying the harm that has been caused. Jin Soji works to reduce polarization between religious and secular actors and between global North and global South, particularly with regard to LGBTQ plus people. Our work challenges the narratives that reinforce polarization. It is crucial because polarization does not serve the LGBTQ plus community, especially those in the global south. One of the consequences of this polarization is that LGBTQ plus people become the battleground for this conflict. We are used as pawns by states and other actors vying for power and status. Against this background, we celebrate the, the resilience of the Ugandan LGBTI movement in challenging the unprecedented tool of oppression and will continue to stand in solidarity with our siblings in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Yahya Saidi from the Global Interfaith Network for People of All Sexes, Sexual Orientations, Gender Identities and Expressions. And I am now opening for questions from the room. Please be very brief in your questions. We will be collecting questions and then the speakers will have a brief opportunity to answer. 
I also have a number of questions from the Zoom, but would like to give you the opportunity first. And as it seems we do not have questions in, in the room, we have on our Zoom a question from Amiga Jason. After people knew I deliver HIV support services to LGBTIQ plus people, most started to hate me and move away from me. But I think this isn't a problem because everyone has a right to health and life. This should not stop them for accessing, this should not uh, stop people from accessing services because we are brothers and sisters. We should work together and help each other. Was that one question? Are there more? And there might be more. Still, maybe someone from the room wants to put forward a question and now. Please, United States. Thank you. And thank you, Wright, for putting one together. It's really important panel, and especially to our two human rights defenders from Iran and for your interventions today. Uh, I was particularly taken uh, by Katya's comments calling for uh, stronger sanctions and more severe actions to be taken. Uh, in the statement made by the Secretary of State following the signing of the Anti Homosexuality Act, the United States pointed to potential future actions, although we are still taking a look at all of our assistance. In particular, we're very concerned about how we will be able to continue to implement our significant funding through the President's Emergency Plan to fight HIV AIDS and our program. Uh, so my question would be to both uh, Cameron and Kasha, what are the kinds of steps that you would like to see us take? And also, what are the areas that you want to ensure that we protect against because we obviously want to ensure that both assistance coming from the United States and from other uh, nations to Uganda, that any changes to our funding and any cutbacks also still fit within that overarching principle of do no harm and do not lead to a further targeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, United States and the lady over there. Thank you so much. Uh, Claire Mann from the Global Human Rights Group. Um, our organization is working with a number of human rights defenders in Uganda at the moment, and I really want to congratulate and thank the Uganda defenders who are here presenting their, their perspectives today. Um, one of the things that we have uh, found particularly difficult, and which uh, I would call on the, the diplomats present to, to take us feedback back to their capitals, is the need to ensure safe passage and easy access to asylum for those who, who are at risk and whose, whose lives are at risk and moving to, to uh, leave the country. Um, this is something which I know a number of states are particularly good at, and others it's very difficult. Um, and also a, another factor is um, that the international community needs to do more to protect those who are in transit in asylum, particularly the, the issues of violence that we're seeing in the refugee camp in, in Kenya for LGBT activists who are, are escaping through Kenya. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to turn to our distinguished panelists for a last round of answers and um, maybe one more final comment. Did I miss someone? That doesn't seem, yes, I'm sorry. Le <laughs> Peba, no, no, no. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, sorry for coming in uh, uh, a little bit late. Thank you very much for convening uh, this, for being this uh, very important and timely uh, meeting. It's an, uh, an issue that occupies us a lot, also in the Netherlands, and we are I think, looking in line with the statements that the US just made. And we're a little bit in doubt about how we, how we should engage and how we should be, how we can be pragmatic and idealistic at the same time. So. Any um, suggestions uh, from your side on how to approach this as a broader uh, country, a Western country, a white country, a former colonial country, and also a country that has uh, LGBT blood rights very, very high uh, in its regard? Um, and I had an additional question. I was wondering, could you perhaps elaborate a little bit more um, on uh, the funding and like organizations? 
uh, like outside of Uganda, who were maybe involved in, in financing this this anti LGBTQ plus uh, narrative and rhetoric, or do you believe that it's generally generally uh, grassroots? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I would like to hand over to Kasha to start the round of answers and last comments. Uh, did I hear my name? Ah, okay. <laughs> um, I didn't. I didn't get the last question, uh, but I'll try to attempt uh, the one from the US. I think it was about um, how to go about with this, um, uh, with our calls to cutting aid, and uh, and how they can continue to work without affecting, without affecting their. Uh, their programs, if I got the uh, the answer correct, uh, I think we've been uh, we've made it very clear that we don't really want aid cuts. We just want um, we just want our development partners to to go back on the drawing board to make sure that the aid that they're really sending is going to the right people, and also the policies of inclusivity are looked into because Uganda uh, Uganda is very known as a corrupt country and that uh, that is for a fact and most of this aid that is coming is actually the money that is being used to implement such laws and um, like the recent laws um, um, and also the violence the state violence and uh, most of the funding that comes to Uganda this is what it does uh, the government is using it for other other programs instead of the intended programs. So it's high time that our uh, our donors, uh, our funders really go back on their drawing board and look through their inclusivity uh, policies, um, look through their the accountability bit uh, of, of the funding that they send to our countries. Then I also um, had the issue of um, asylum. Yes, we've seen so many people leaving our countries. We have an influx and we have an influx of LGBT people since 2014 that have since crossed over to Kakuma camp uh, from Uganda. And the conditions there are, are not easy. And it's because many have been there since 2014. That's over 10 years. And the excuse we get is that um, our, partner, our partner countries have, have refused to open their borders to them. And these are these are LGBT refugees who are also again put in more dangerous environments because they are still again with homophobic and transphobic people in in the camps, and we've seen a lot of violence there. So I really appreciate um appreciate the call to to Western countries to open their borders to to LGBT people when they seek asylum, uh, but also to to continue um, from just to to make a small a small um compliment uh, to my colleague um, uh, Sandu from uh, from Ilga. Uh, I really appreciate that um, you, you shared this uh, with the participants, especially the issues of the tensions, the, the diplomatic tensions that these sanctions and calls to actions may cause. And we've already seen what is happening uh, when the European Union has come out to speak, when the U US has come out to speak. And very many people have said that we are calling for sanctions, but we are going to get a backlash back home. There is no backlash that we are going to get that we have already not gotten. We've already been scapegoated uh, and we are always a scapegoat. And for us to really sit down and come up with these um, very serious calls to action, it's because we've seen somehow they've worked in the past and we think that others can actually work and prevent uh, Uganda from being a role model to other African countries. So when we call, when we hear people saying that when we call for for maybe harsh sanctions and all this. These are not sanctions. We're just trying to hold our government to account. And we need our partners to do that uh, because they, they are in, in place, in position to do it. And we can never be more scapegoated than we already are because even when the bombings, for example, happened in Uganda in 2010, um, the terrorist bombings, all the newspapers said it was the homos that actually bombed Uganda. So we've always been used as a scapegoat for everything. How can homos be called terrorists bombing Ugandan embassies and all that? So 
for us to sit down and call for these uh, sanctions is because we've used some of them in the past and they've worked and we believe that um, uh, first of all, the community is not a pariah community. We are part and parcel of, of, of the broader community in Uganda. And we know that we do not want aid cut in totality to be cut because we still use, uh, we still also need it uh, and we still uh, we are still part and parcel of, of our community. But we just need the development partners to really sit down and have clear guidelines on how this funding should be done, uh, inclusivity, and also to remember that they also have their workers um, in, in our countries, uh, uh, diplomats um, uh, in our countries, expatriates, uh, foreigners, and all this. Do they really want to expose uh, expose their countrymen? Um, sorry, I'm finishing. I, I, I really... I, I want to thank you uh, again uh, for the opportunity. And I think the dialogue, I hope the dialogue can continue, you can send um, more questions to the organizers who can pass them on to us. But I really just want people to know that uh, we're at crossroads here and uh, we need to we need to do uh, to take some really serious measures to stop all the violence that is going on because this is just the beginning. It's going to continue going on if something serious is not done. So thank you so much and, and have Happy Pride Month. Thank you very much, Kata. And actually, the best events are those that have to end when you feel you're in the middle of the discussion. So I want to apologize, especially to our other two panelists that we have now run out of time. It is six o'clock. I would propose especially that maybe uh, the gentleman from the, the Netherlands uh, could still, that you could still speak um, about the situation so that you also get the the answer to your question. And um, for Guru Chaten Sandu, you can reach Ilga. You will find Ilga on the internet to ask your question and continue to reach out. This was a fantastic discussion. Uh, a big, big thank you to all of you who attended. A big thank you to the panelists. I think we learned a lot. And on Wednesday at 3.30, Victor Madrigal will uh, present his report. We heard a call for friends of Sobi to speak up in that presentation. We heard calls for accountability, both in the countries, but also in Western states for funding that comes from that territory. We heard calls for safe passage and um, Kasha said also for donors to, to go back to the drawing board and really understand the situation and, and think it through. And I think the context with the community and learning from them directly are the most important ones. So again, thank you for all your insights. Uh, we hope this is just the start of a conversation and uh, we wish you a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.